thank you for that, that very warm welcome. And um, I'm really privileged to be working with Jackie because what Jackie continues to do is uh, hold our feet to the fire to make sure that we have um, diversity and inclusion right at the heart of everything that we're doing when we're thinking about our future workforce and our existing workforce. So thank you, Jackie, for holding us to account and, and long may it continue. Um, but I would just like to say, I'm really also privileged to um, be the Mental Health Senior Responsible Officer for Health Education England as part of my um, Director of Nursing role. And I'm not a mental health nurse originally, I'm what they call an adult nurse, which sounds bonkers in itself actually. Um, but I've kind of learned so much on the mental health journey through this work. And I've never, I've never sort of stopped being amazed by all of the efforts that people go to, the passion and commitment around mental health. And, and just now I've sat next to this wonderful lady called Dame Hillary um, that's talked to me about the benefits of knitting and the mental health and well-being that's, that's realised when you actually help somebody to knit or give them the tools um, to, to, to do something creative, to give them choices, whether it's picking the needles, whether it's picking um, the wool, whatever it might be. And so I just want to say, you know, please keep doing all that you're doing around the mental health agenda, but don't let's just see it in, within a narrow spectrum, because I think the spectrum of mental health and well-being and the pioneers out there, like Dame Hillary, with her work, um, you know, knitting across the world for people. And there's evidence within these documents that shows it makes a difference to older people's health and well-being. Um, so I think the sky really is the limits when it comes to mental health. And I do think, although we've got a lot to do, which I will share with you shortly in this presentation, I think we're moving quite fast and we're making a difference. And I do believe that the mental health community can lead the way in terms of delivering holistic care. That really does make a difference to people. So Health Education England, we exist for one reason, and that's to improve the health and well-being of the people of England by developing a workforce with the right skills, values, um, and ensuring that that enables them to deliver outstanding care. And in terms of mental health within Health Education England, again, really, as I said earlier, really privileged um, to be leading this work and to have a national programme within Health Education England. We're mandated uh, to work across the system from government on this agenda, which is brilliant. And what we're trying to do, um, obviously, first and foremost, achieve better outcomes for patients, people and the communities they live within for mental health. Um, but we know it's about working across the system. We know it's about building relationships. And where we've had some of our most successes within the mental health work has been when we've really collaborated and we've, we've come together as a team across the voluntary sector, across the, um, obviously the NHS, with arm's length bodies to really make a difference. And it is just worth, you know, we've had a lot of policy work over the last uh, few years. And I think since 2015, the publication of Future in Mind, we have come a long way. I can't pretend to tell you I'm not petrified by the workforce growth and the ambitions, both within Stepping Forward and the Mental Health Long Term Plan, but it's absolutely the right thing to do. And I would just like to pay tribute to the leadership of, of Claire Murdoch, who um, is the overall SRO for mental health across the system whose unwavering support and tenacity um, has made sure that there's investment moving forward, that it's front and centre within the long-term plan, and mental health services are being listened to and they're being taken really seriously, which is, which is just an amazing achievement um, for one person to drive forward uh, with a team. So some of our achievements um, that, we, that we have achieved, and again, these have been things that um, you know, I've been learning about. If we think about the improving access to psychological therapies, we've got a workforce growth within that area um, and we're achieving targets. This is about prevention as opposed to cure, getting people access to these services um, so that hopefully they can stay out of hospital. But we've got more work to do. We've got to provide career opportunities and we've got to look at the pools of people um, that want to go into this sort of work and make sure, as Jackie will be reminding us, that they're diverse, that they're inclusive, that they reflect the communities in which they work, they work uh, within. 
We also know we've got to increase the workforce capacity and capability. So that's not just the numbers, but actually we need to upskill lots of people that work in communities around health and well-being and the link between mental and physical health. And I'm still, you know, I still hear those stories about people going into A&E with a mental health condition and the staff not being well enough prepared to know how to look after them effectively and how to not be frightened um, of people with mental health. I was also privileged to lead the dementia work when we first started HE back in 2012. And, um, and, and if you want a bit of inspiration, I think here it possibly is. We had a target to get 100,000 people trained in dementia awareness across the NHS. We now have over a million people that are registered that have dementia awareness training. And I don't hear so many people saying they're afraid of people with dementia because we've really increased that awareness. We've really give people the skills. And you know we've put a real human focus upon that condition. So if we can do it for dementia, I'm sure we can do it for everything else as well. And then the other area that's been fascinating, because we all talk about workforce as you know, a huge problem. Where are we going to get the people from? Can we get enough people into the system? Well, we created um, with NHS England and the Department of Education uh, this new role, this educational mental health practitioner. And it was oversubscribed by over a thousand percent. And in terms of those numbers, I'll just give you the facts. We had 2,500 applicants for 250 places. So that's telling us there are people out there that are curious, that want to work within mental health services. And if we get the right offer, the right training package, a career framework wrapped around it, um, the flexibility for people to work across systems, because this role is very much about working across education and mental health services, then it seems to me that we can attract the people. So let's be positive and hopeful about that. Um, and we're also really excited, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, eight, eight key roles in mental health that we are going to really grow as part of our ambitions to deliver a more comprehensive service. Um, so our aims are right at the heart of it, is around this person-centered approach. It isn't about mental or physical health, it's about delivering <coughs> person-centered care. And we need to enhance people's knowledge and skills around that agenda. We need to never forget our staff and make sure we care for them just as much as we want to care well for the people that we treat. Um, it's got to be about workforce development. We've got to be competent and we've got to really focus on rewarding careers. I think too often we create a role, but we don't think what that role will look like in 10 years time. What would somebody be doing 10 years time? when they go in. So the concept of career frameworks, the concept of stackable qualifications, being able to step on, step off, flexibility in training is something that's at the, the heart of what HE is trying to achieve. And we're really plugged in um, to the interim people plan and the work that's going on across the system so that that actually is realized by everybody. It's not just about widgets. We're not numbers. We're people and we need careers and opportunities. I think the other area, again, that we've seen focus and success around is um, where we've had the, the, the perinatal work. And if we look at the knowledge base that we have now increased in relation to perinatal, um, where we need to have inpatient services, there was quite a worry, you know, when the services were planned. Well, where is the workforce going to come from? But actually, again, if we have the right education and training packages in place, we make it clear what's required within those services, we seem to be able to recruit to them. So we're really excited about the, the new specialist perinatal mental health in both community and inpatient. And again, we're looking to have um, an extra 1,700 <coughs> therapists and supervisors by 2021, and all services um, for children and young people within IAP service, within the IAP programs will be within that. So that has to be a good thing. and. You know, we only have to listen to people that experience that perinatal mental health. And, you know, there's probably as many of us that have got loved ones or we know somebody that's experienced it. Um, such an essential service to be able to get in there quick and help people through that, uh, that stage. I think the other things that we're looking at um, are scoping activities. And one of the things that popped up for us was uh, working with the ambulance service. We had, um, we had a session... Uh, with the ambulance service around adult mental health training and suicide prevention. 
And what people were telling us within those services was that, again, you know, they weren't getting the training around suicide prevention. They didn't know how to deal with it to help people hopefully, you know, not make that decision and pathway them to the right services. But when they had found somebody that had committed suicide, where was the help and support for those people within those services? And as a result, we're doing lots of work and we've had a, we had a round table around this about how we can help. And just for example, on the Isle of Wight, you know, a nurse was skilled up actually to sit within the ambulances and within the police cars um, to help support the, that workforce when they were faced with going to a suicide or trying to prevent somebody um, from, from uh, having a suicide. And again, the power of some interventions, the difference it had on that retention of that workforce, but what it showed was we need teams to work together. And it's not just about the there and now, but where's the restorative supervision um, when, when you experience these things as a practitioner? So lots more work to come within the blue light services for us. We're also developing other resources, and you know, please do always look out on HE's website. So we're looking at developing physical health competency frameworks, older persons uh, competency framework, and I shall be making the links to the knitting um, to make sure that's, that's within there, uh, having had that conversation. Um, extending perinatal care to, um, to 24 months, and also adult um, eating disorders. We know there's a lot of work to do within eating disorders, and we're really starting to break more into that because we, we do understand it's really complex, the diagnosis, the treatment, um, you know, how, how you really work with this condition. And we're doing research and working with Tim Kendall around, around what education and training tools we need to make available so that you can care effectively for those people. And as well as that, we're also developing now in Health Education England a methodology for how you go about workforce transformation and trying to put perhaps a little bit more rigor around why you create a new role, what things you need to consider, what's the supply pipeline that you've got already, what's the leadership requirements to get a new role into, where's there a need for upskilling and we've got this thing called the STAR um, in HE and you can access the STAR and you can play yourself with the tools within there. So for those of you that are running services or you want to pitch a business case to create a new role or to think about your future supply or your current supply, um, you can work with this tool to identify what it is you need. So we're really, really pleased with this work and hope that people will use it at the national level, the regional level, STP level, and actually within your own organisation. So if we just do a talk about these new roles, and, and I am really excited about these because of whilst these are not new roles um, per se, they're kind of new roles within mental health services that we think we can scale up. Again, I would just like to reiterate mental health lead in the way. So these roles all are already within mental health services, but we think that we can grow lots more. We think that we can create dynamic roles with allied health professionals so we get more allied health professionals within the service. We think pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, there's a huge opportunity there around medicines management to think differently about how we staff our units, our areas and our communities. Social workers, and the social workers are crying out uh, to work with us within the mental health. So we've now got those um, within the system too. And physician associates, this is quite new. We know physician associates is a new is a newish workforce, delighted that it's going to be regulated and that legislation is now through. And we're now working with the Royal College to explore, well, what would a physician associate look like within mental health? What sort of work would they do? And how would they add value? And how can it become a rewarding career for people within that field? Um, obviously, mental health nurses, as a nurse myself, I would say, Often they're the backbone of most services within health and care. We need more of them, but we need them to stay and we need them to have fulfilling careers. And then finally, our nursing associates, which is a role I'm really particularly proud of, a, a piece of work that I've led introducing a new role um, into the system. And I've got a, I won't talk too much about it because there's actually a film that will talk for itself around an actual nursing associate that I'll show sh uh, very shortly. And again, I just want to talk a little bit here about, you know, some of our products. 
as we're going with Health Education England, we're seven years in now, we're learning what works well. We know that when we work with our partners, we know that when we create task and finish groups that are inclusive, expert reference groups that know what they're doing, we create great products. And, and that's what we're all about. So we're trying to create these high quality products that then you can take the principles, you can take the tools and you can use them within your own organizations. And this is the video of our nursing associate. A lot of HEAs, a lot of medical staff are so passionate about what they do but it's impossible to go to get any further. However, the nurse and associate role come in and it was like winning the lottery. Everything's possible. You can work, study, become qualified. It's inspiring staff that are already in the NHS to make their skills better, that they are needed, that they are valued. My trust, Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Trust, has supported nurse and associates the whole way. I think if the NA role didn't exist, we would still be looking for the answer. So we know that we're struggling to get registered nurses and we know that we need to find new ways of working to sort of drive services forward. The role is really interesting because it kind of sits in the middle of everything. It does bridge the gap between mental health and healthcare. If you've got a nurse and associate who's been trained both medically with mental health or learning disabilities, then bringing those all in, you can care on different aspects. So you can deal with the patient and their mental health. Then if, obviously if they become poorly, you can recognise those signs. You can flag them up to your nurse in charge. But you're there to enhance the service, not to remove it from somebody else. You know, there is always a need for registered nurses. We need registered nurses, that is still the case now. But it sort of adds something different. Knots Healthcare are looking at what we can do differently, and it, it just absolutely supports that. I personally have 15 years' experience. There are lots of other HCAs out there with many, many years of experience that are highly, highly skilled that can't advance for possibly the same reason as myself. Money, can't afford it. You, you're losing loads of people who could qualify as nurses. You're losing that experience that, and that passion. Nikki has really sort of excelled in bringing the enthusiasm to it. She's made it her own. You have to kind of fit your studying in placement life, your family, and even though it's exhausting, you get tired, to become a mental health nurse, to be qualified finally and have what I've always wanted, that's what drives me, that's what keeps me going. I never thought I would have this opportunity and being a nurse and associate gives me this opportunity.